but Tony, um, I think, in all the circumstances, would have finished his PhD and all the rest of it. Uh, so I think you've probably got the most experience of talking at academic conferences. Uh, I haven't done one before. Oh, seriously? I don't know. No, no, this is... But you talk publicly and stuff like that. Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, I do now. Yeah. It's one of the things I avoided at university. I used to hate the idea of talking in front of people. Before. So this is great. But Tony's um, written a whole range of different things and contributes to press and has written on bed pieces and been extremely articulate about the experiences that he's had and his family have had. So um, I don't know exactly what you're going to focus on. But well, basically, I was, I was going to focus on work. Uh, but first of all, I just want to sort of thank uh, Matt for actually setting up this project. I think it was an absolutely fantastic idea. And I'm really th uh, thankful for Matt for actually giving me the opportunity to do this as well. I'm sure everybody else feels the same. And I want to thank um, the people who welcomed us so, so well in Australia as well. Uh, we had a great time. Um, and it was very um, informative, to say the least. Um, so basically what I want to do is just talk about, focus my, my sort of experiences around the idea of work uh, and it's sort of um, its corollary, that sort of unemployment, um, which I've experienced quite a bit. Um, so my background, I was born in Ashton. Um, I was one of three sons. Um, my father was a miner. My mum, her dad, worked in the Ashton workshops. Um, my dad's brother, my uncle, he is a miner. His son was a miner, and my granddad was a miner as well. So you can imagine, um, it's quite a strong mining family from a strong mining town. It was very, I think in talk about Ashton, it's very much a, a Labour Party place, you know. There's no way anybody else is going to get in. It's just, when I was a child, it was Labour or nothing. There was no, no sort of um, discussion about it. It was Labour. Because I think the unions were so strong, uh, there was a solidarity between um, because of the mines, because of the unions, and a very sort of close-knit close community because I think down to the, the experience, everybody had a shared experience of, of, of what was a very, very difficult job, uh, very hard work, uh, a very, very, very demanding, very, very dangerous job as well. Um, a job I didn't want to do because basically I'm a bit much of a coward, I think, basically it was just far too scary. Um, <laughs> it, and my family sort of um, obviously experienced some horrible, um, horrible sort of situations. Like my grandfather obviously experienced people dying with him or dying next to him, uh, people being seriously injured. And I think that I think there's a certain bond in their uh, experience. I think one of the most formative things for me when it comes to um, people working together, I think actual common experience is one of the main things. And, you know, you read all your books you want, but when you actually when, it, when the sort of veils come down, you see what's actually happening. I think that's really, if you're the end of that experience, then there's a certain solidarity brought about by that certain sort of uh, commonality. Um, so the closest to getting that I got to mine, and basically, uh, was talking to my father and my grandfather. I just kept that whole thing away from me. Uh, he just, the grandfather used to tell me about the old days and um, how uh, they had poor health and safety the pod took with huge risks and dangers, uh, long hours. I think he, my granddad even worked weekends. And there was times where he'd, he'd, he'd tell me about things like how during the winter time it was dark by three or four o'clock. He talked about weeks where he, he was in four shift, which is 12, it was like through the day sort of thing. And he'd actually go to work and it was dark. And he'd come home and it was dark. And he worked in the dark. And that was it. He just said darkness for sometimes weeks, sometimes longer. And I thought that was horrendous. <laughs> no one else was scared. And he used to talk about as well the uh, cruelty of the young classes. Um, grandfather had a lot of disrespect for people like Winston Churchill, who was obviously quite a sort of uh, iconic figure in our history. But he, I'd say, he virtually hated him. Uh, like quite a few miners did for various reasons. But he did have a, a dislike for the young classes. I think it went quite strongly through um, the grandfather's generation because of the way they were threat certainly before the war, and even after the war, it was quite sort of hard work, obviously, and a lot of um, disregard for people's health and safety, and the risks that they um, entailed, basically. Uh, but this, when I, when I was younger, it was one of the things that really, really sort of um, 
that sort of struck struck me in mind. I couldn't understand I couldn't understand the idea of ownership. I always remember Grand explaining these people who who lived, you know, down south or like absentee landlords and told them well, this is how you should live or this is how you work and you can't have higher wages and you should be working Saturdays and you know, you're not gonna get this health and safety. And I couldn't understand how how does people own what we live on? How do they have a right to, to say, this is mine, this, this core I can exploit, I can take this out of the ground, and by implication, own the workers? And I couldn't get my head around it as a child. And quite honest, and, you know, as time went on, I just forgot about it and accepted that you know, that's part of our culture. Some people succeed, do well, and, and they're that one us. That's fine. You know, perhaps they deserve it or whatever. Uh, when, I, um, when I grew up, I got a bit older, um, and I left school, I sort of hung around, obviously, for as long as possible, being a coward, I didn't want to be end up in the pits, you know, the last place. Uh, my father didn't want us to go to the pit either, and my grandfather didn't, so they had this sort of, this strange dichotomy where there was an admiration for these people working down the pit, but they didn't want their own sons or family to be involved. Uh, so, I left school, and I ended, actually ended up being unemployed um, for several years. Um, now, my unemployment at first it was obviously quite, quite degrading. I think going to any job centre at sign on is um, it's not a sort of uh, an experience I would sort of say was pleasant. It's certainly not. You don't go in there. It's not like the adverts where you'd see people smiling and let's find your job. And, <laughs> hey, go in here. Well, let's sit down and work things out. It was very sort of cold, and you know, it's like it was as if they were taking money out their own pockets. And it's quite harsh, and there was a, an element of sort of punishment to it that you shouldn't be here, that it's your fault. Um, and because of obviously Ashton's not you know the most booming town, but when I was uh, when I was in the job centre, I did start noticing after a while there seemed to be two types of people. There was a type of people who came out and they looked defeated, their heads are down, they didn't seem to have any sort of life. It was, like, it was almost like a zombie type person. You all say, oh, that's a zombie. They're, they're unemployed for a long time. They seem to be defeated. Then there's the other types who basically were like, you know, I'm not going to take this. You know, you, you can stigmatise me or I'm not taking this from people. I'm, I'm better than this. And there was a, a, sort of, a strange sort of cockiness, sort of resistance to that. And after a while, I sort of joined that sort of lab group and became a little bit sort of rebellious. And I remember myself saying... Times when I was out weekends with me and um, my friends, I'd say ridiculous things like, you know, oh, you're the suckers for working. You know, <laughs> I can lie in bed. Who's sunbathing tomorrow? And you, you sort of make sort of we had we had statements to sort of validate what you know you're going through. You don't want to be seen, I don't want to be seen as some sort of useless, you know, scrounger. And I was like saying, well, you, if you think about it, you're the ones that's the fools. And so I almost fitted into that stereotypical, you know, oh, I don't want to work, I'm you know, <laughs> What's the point? And I was really quite bullshy at times, and probably irritated me mates. And, and also found as well that um, by, when I was out with mates, that quite often, you know, if I started chatting with a, a young girl and it was, things were going quite well, as soon as I mentioned, I was on the door. There seemed to be this blankness came across. Them. <laughs> I mean, maybe personality, it could be just that, maybe some. <laughs> but it was just, there's several occasions where. It just went, and you could see it. There was a glazed expression, um, and of course, you know, realistically, I was excluded. That's really what was happening. Um, I couldn't join my mates for, you know, pub lunch. I didn't have the money. Couldn't go shopping with them. I never understood that one. How do you go shopping when you got no money? Uh, so I had to sort of make excuses. Uh, I couldn't go and see, you know, the latest bands because you didn't have the cash for tickets. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was quite sort of, in a way, it was very much, I think it's sort of a, a coping strategy. You know, you, you tell people you're doing well, you, you feel fine, but deep down, you know, you actually, you're hurting. Uh, and, you know, excluded, without a doubt. Um, but another thing that really, really did bother me um, was there was something else niggling at us, and it comes from me father and grandfather's generation. And that was, they believed it was like drummed in with that you had to work, and those who worked basically got like just desserts. You know, you work hard, you get your rewards. Um, 
And so there was this, I wasn't actually, I wasn't contributing to the community, uh, and I wasn't contributing to the nation. I took the press to all this, you know, obviously I was a scrounger. So there was a horrible niggling, like, splinter in the back of my mind, but that I was, yeah, there was some sort of confirmation about the sort of person I was. I was feeling because, you know, I didn't, I didn't sort of contribute, at least to the people around us. And then, of course, the worst thing happened. The minor strike started, and I was unemployed. Uh, and everybody came together and tried to help each other, but I couldn't contribute financially because here was me who didn't have a job. So this put added stress on my family, certainly. Um, although, to be fair, uh, people did put together and have got a quite a tight-knit family. I think, Mike, uh, you sort of describe it as sound of music. Sort of family. <laughs> <laughs> although we don't sing. Um, but um, just to sort of give you a little bit of a, an idea, when I... When the strike was actually on, or just before the strike, my father was working at Woodhorn Colliery, which is now closed, which is uh, the museum. Uh, and there he worked uh, in a seam. So this is what, 1984. And he worked in a seam, um, and it was as low as 30 inches. So you're like talking about that. So miles on the ground, in the dark, uh, lots of dust, sometimes in water, uh, for eight <coughs> hours at a time. Uh, and it was very noisy. And he did that day after day. And I, like I say, once again, I was like, not me, no chance. Uh, but then, he did this horrible work, all these men did this horrible work, grafted away, uh, well, probably some of the hardest work, as I should say, physically, in the country without a doubt. And then suddenly, overnight, we became the enemy within. Uh, we all, our families, uh, my family certainly, uh, and everybody around were the enemy. Um, which I found sort of a strange, strange sort of awakening for me, because almost overnight the, the whole idea of that, you know, hard work gets its rewards, was just smashed to smithereens. Just as a strike would be twelve months later, basically, um, it didn't seem to me true anymore. I looked all around us and saw all these hard-working men, and they all became <coughs> an enemy. It was like, that's your, that's your just rewards. It was a, a certain sort of irony about the saying after that, that hard work gets its just rewards. Um, and sadly, because of the strike, uh, well, because what was basically, I think, a malicious attack on unions, obviously, um, the, our community started losing pits, losing jobs, and, and it really lost its vitality uh, and its spirit to a great extent. Um, main, the main street for one lost, it had a lot of quite independent shops, I remember, I think there was a crisps shop, it was like, it was called crisps, it didn't sell crisps, you know. It was called crisps and it, it was like, you know, Marks and Spencer's toy shop. It was like fantastic, I remember going, that was great. Uh, and Jewelers, who, somebody who was distantly related to me, not close enough, unfortunately, probably had a bit more money. Um, but these sort of little independent shops all disappeared. And today we've had, I think, the last time I walked down the street, we've got eight charity shops on the main street. And this is a quite a small town. Um, Pawn shops, obviously, you know, um, to get your wages or whatever early. And four bookmakers and an amusement arcade. And they're all within <laughs> a space of, what, 200 yards? And that's sort of the centre of action now. So uh, quite, quite sad, sort of, quite sort of a sad experience, but also um, actually in a way sort of an enlightened experience because not only did, did the whole idea of, you know, the easy axiom, that axiom, like if you work hard, you get a reward. There was also this thing where I remember one day walking into the, the news agents, I remember seeing the Sun newspaper during the strike, and it said something ridiculous. It was, what was it? It was uh, Arthur Scargill feeds red babies. Now, I never realised how dangerous babies were, but obviously, they were the word of the Sun. And in the whole thing about the media and what we told on the TV, also, the, cur <laughs> the sort of curtain was removed and became, it became something totally different. I didn't trust the media anymore. I didn't trust what people were telling us about, you know, hard work. And I think it was an awakening, but also I take myself as a rite of passage. I was learning about life uh, and the reality of what life is, especially for a community like Ashton. Um, okay, basically, uh, I used to also pop down and see my grandfather and grandmother quite often, uh, just about every day. And one of the things that struck me about them as well when I started sort of really thinking about what's happening in society and our, our sort of local society. Um, I'd walk down the street and door after door would be like Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Jones, uh, 
Mrs. Anderson, and there'd be no men. There'd be six widows and maybe a couple. Then another six or seven widows and be grandma and granda. And I realised that yeah, here was all these men working hard and, and not even getting their retirement. You know, they had long before retirement saw them and it was really, really quite sad. But anyway, um, during my unemployment, um, how I moved on and how things changed for me was uh, I actually did a few fiddle jobs, as you have to do, uh, which led for me, I did a few fiddle jobs and things like the local bootmakers. Uh, I remember one day after signing on and I was, I was doing the boards, well, there was the old days before the technology came in the screen, so I actually got a part-time job just writing the prices up when I came over. I used to have a blow-off, anybody remember that? And I used to stand doing... I remember, um, I remember sort of the door opening and the boss, the manager of the job centre walked in and I was signing on, and just signed on, and here I was I standing doing the boards. I always remember being, I don't think I've ever concentrated on prices so much in my life. <laughs> I just made sure I kept you back to them all the time. And, and prayed, I could hear somebody going, Tony, Tony. And I was like, prices, prices. <laughs> and luckily, for some reason, he didn't know us, and I, I got away with it, because obviously, doing any sort of fiddle work um, is dicey, and losing your benefits is, um, well, not something you want to uh, experience. Uh, but I'm saying that, doing fiddle work, the irony was, um, I actually got a job through. So it was like, it was like my own sort of training scheme, whatever, or work placement, actually. Um, <laughs> I ended up working as a, <laughs> a manager in a bookmaker's. So, um, and I worked there for 13 years in the end. So apart from um, um, working in the bookmaker's, I did a few sort of occasional shop work as well and uh, and actually worked on a, a, a one scheme. I've had an experience of one year on the scheme, simply one year. Uh, I worked at a local YMCA uh, with the, the children and I have to say that scheme made me probably the best snooker player I've ever been with. That's about <laughs> all I can say about it. That's all I, I remember sort of having a laugh with the kids, but a great fun. I'm sure like perhaps the kids got something out of it and um, perhaps the snooker, snooker playing enhanced their snooker playing. But that was my one experience of the scheme. Jumping ahead a little bit, so we've got the future, um, after obviously working, um, and then I finished work and met Matt at uni. Uh, so things go downhill even more. <laughs> 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 and then in 2003, 2008, sorry, there's a crash, um, and I was unemployed again. I just left uni. I had, there was personal reasons for leaving uni. uni my, my marriage had fallen apart. Uh, and... I ended up unemployed. And this time, it was worse. I just couldn't believe it. I thought it was going to be something the same, the same sort of uh, miserable faces as you go in and not much help. But in this situation, I was actually not living with my parents, so obviously one reason why it was more difficult. But also, cost of living was greater. Rents were high. Heating bills were high. And, and also, austerity policies were kicking in and the idea of sanctioning. Now, I ended up being sanctioned, and I can only say I do not believe in sanctioning for anybody. I think it's an absolute disgrace. Um, no one should be sanctioned. These people are struggling, um, and Carl is another person. There's two in our groups being sanctioned, um, and it basically put me in a situation where, just to give you an idea of money, I you get well, I used to get 320 quid a month rent, uh, well housing benefit. My rent was 400. I was sanctioned, so I've got a minimum, oh, I'm telling you, I've got a maximum of hardship, which is 44 quid a week. So that's, what, 154, 56 or whatever? 80 of that had to go to my rent. That left us less than 80 for four weeks. I had to feed myself and pay my bills and keep the internet going. Obviously, that one went straight away. So here was a strange situation where I was being sanctioned, I was unemployed, looking for work, Yet, they were taking the internet away from us, because, which was great for looking for work, um, and making life so difficult. I was having to write to the council for hardship to get me a little boost of something that's going to be 20 or 30 quid extra, perhaps a week or a month. Um, and we had life very, very hard. I, I couldn't really understand how somebody's trying to get you a job, and yet they stop you in every possible way. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I found interesting is quite a few of the job centre staff, the sort of, I'd say the more pleasant ones probably, um, do sort of have a, 
a certain something. I'm not saying they're all bad. There was one chap who um, I was mentioned him. I mentioned how I had been sanctioned and what happened, and he sort of put his head down and sort of said, "Well, you know, I know where you're coming from." He said, "I'll tell you honestly, I've got people coming in here who are sanctioning, who just turned to me and said, look, if I, if I don't get my money, I've got to find money somewhere. I'll have to go back on to dealing drugs. And he says, I have to say, oh, no, don't do that. That's bad. But these chaps are saying, well, where did I get my money from? And he, just as I was leaving, he, he, he said, I sympathise with you. It's a really horrible situation to be in, and I hope it gets sorted. I was putting a peel in at the time. Um, and as I was leaving, he said, but, you know, you've got to understand, we've got targets to meet. And I wasn't, I got, I got halfway down the street, I thought, what do you mean, targets to meet? How does, what does that mean? He's got targets. How do you have targets when you're helping people? It's almost like saying, it's like having a nurse saying, oh, we need, you know, have to more, have more beds in this hospital, so we'll, we'll let 15 die tonight or something. It's, it seemed really bizarre that there was these targets. Within a month or two, um, that would be in whistleblowers came out and they did actually have targets that, you know, people need to be sanctioned, like paying call. It was about cutting down the welfare bill. Which is, I think, once again, horrendous. Uh, a little later, of course, being sort of long term un unemployed, I did actually end up on the infamous work program. Um, oh, I could tell you so lots of stories about that one. Um, but where would I start? I think it was on the program three months. Um, three months in, and we had a meeting, I think it was 12 or 13 of, of us in the meeting. And he basically, the woman came in, stuck four posters on the wall. wall. One was carer, one was call centre, there was a couple others. There was four sort of basic run the mill jobs. And we had to sort of write down on bits of paper what we thought we needed to get these jobs. You know, what do you need, what skills do you need to be, you know, a call centre attendant or to be a carer. And so we're sitting doing all this, and then we're finished. And uh, this other chap came in, he said, Oh, it's all done brilliant. He was obviously the boss. He says, fantastic, fantastic, done, great. He says, uh, oh, you haven't got your names on the bits of paper. Well, nobody told people. I had actually written mine on just because I'm, I'm quite clever. I'm a bit like Matthew with things. So I wrote my name on, you know. And, but most people hadn't. And he turned, and no word of a lie, he just went, oh, well, uh, I'll recognise your handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, I wouldn't have seen him for months. I mean, how is he going to recognise? All right, I'll never know. But that's what he said. He just, well, just moved on. It didn't really matter. And I, I found the work program because I actually ended up working on it. I got a job. I got myself a job, despite being on the work program. <coughs> yeah, I'm sure the work pro program is probably claiming for me for getting me a job, although they didn't help one iota. I got a job, and I worked in a call centre on the work program, which I felt such a traitor. <laughs> it was horrendous. Um, uh, one of the things that I really hated was actually phoning people up who, on their record, you, you could sort of access the SSS records, and on the records, some of the things that were said about them, the illnesses they had, uh, the mental health issues they had, and yet we were phoning them up to attach them to the work program. <laughs> and it's just, it just beggars belief. And there was actually one chap, and I think it was a stress thing, but one, one of end up taking the mickey out of him. You know, and it wasn't about him, it was about the situation because we had phone him. And basically he was injured, seriously injured in 1997. This will be what, 2013 when we phone him. So 16 years. And he's laying on a board on his back for 16 years. And he couldn't go to the DSSS because he couldn't get up. And so we were actually attached him to the work programme. I don't know where or how he's going to get there. But for some reason this chat was on the list. And so we, we were sort of trying to decide, what's he going to do? And, you know, I, I sort of suggested, he could be a sniper, turn him over. <laughs> <laughs> so he suggested, you know, like, put pipe, pipe things on, drag him through a pipe. I mean, what could this poor bloke do? It, it's ridiculous to think. And we, we were phoning people up who were ill. I phoned one person up who burst into tears and says, I just want to join my husband. And she had a list of illnesses, health issues, widowed, and it, it was an absolute disgrace. Um, one of the things I feel ashamed about a little bit, quite honest, a uh, very exploitive system. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> what I basically want to say, um, my experience, I sort of have like a pot of history of my experience. I've done sort of other things well, obviously. Uh, but it's pot of history, I would say that 
work for me has been very much a disappointment, despite all the, the rhetoric and all the you know, how great work is. And I mean, apart from academics and things and lectures, that's great work, obviously. You know, <laughs> the great people. But some of the jobs I was involved with, you know, working with bookmakers, I wasn't exactly. You know, I could see people who came in who had obviously gambling addictions. Um, but then there was no policy then to sort of say, well, you know, perhaps you should see some money about it. I've seen people lose uh, that dull money, um, the grocery money within two or three hours. Um, and obviously, you know, people with big issues. And now I end up with a <laughs> work program uh, and really bullying people. And so work for me has been quite sort of disappointing in <coughs> my, my work life. And somebody asked me a couple of years ago, my partner says, um, so what, we keep talking about work and you seem to sort of not like many jobs. As, what's the good things? What's sort of you getting out of work? And I said nothing. And that's, I think that's really, really sad that I've gotten a stage in my life and work for me actually means nothing. And I do feel bad about that. I'd love it to be different. But I think there's lots of people like me and I've talked to lots of people. There's a, there's like, I think Matthew mentioned this and it's one of the things we've talked about before, that um, there's a lot of waste of talent there's lots of talent out there, there's lots of people who, you know, have got to get up and go, but it seems to be stifled, and we're, you know, we're throwing it all away. And I find that really, really sad, and I'm sad for myself, I'd love to see otherwise, I'd love to see, oh yeah, I was involved with this, I helped these people. And I think, you know, certainly when it comes to the sort of health industry, education, um, fantastic, must be quite satisfying doing things like that. Um, I could go back, I'll change things, maybe do things different, I'm not saying it's just... You know, government's fault, whatever. Obviously, there's personal responsibility there as well. You know, we are looked at things, perhaps. But that, to me, is really sort of, um, like I say, quite a sad sort of element of my life to think back that we seem to waste a lot of time. Because work is you know, a great part of uh, our lives. Um, so one thing is I, I really was interested in about this project is um, what is work? The question of what work is, it seems to me that... When we talk about work, when it's discussed in the press, or when people you meet people on the street and they talk about it, you know, there's this idea that work is good, unemployment is bad. It's like over two, you know, two legs good, four legs, four legs bad, or whatever, all that sort of thing. <laughs> it's like, is it? But what's before that? I mean, you know, there's no questions about work. Work's just taken as a good, regardless. And I, I find that quite sort of, you know, looking back in the past and all the examples of the miners and how they worked, slaved away, uh, and we think of my grandfather. And how he, you know, he retired. He was lucky enough to live to in his 90s, quite honest. You know, one of the, the few. Uh, but, you know, he sat there with his carriage clock he got, you know, he had for 50 years service. And it probably reminded him of all the, you know, the years and the days and hours he actually spent in the darkness, which is you know, wonderful. And I just thought, well, you know, we should be questioning the idea of work. Is it actually contributing to our society? And what is the common good? I mean, what, what are we doing all this work for? And if the work actually goes nowhere, I mean, I think there's jobs out there, I think you probably could identify them yourselves, there's jobs out there which are pretty, if not pointless, they're probably destructive. Like, I think my, my job was actually destructive. It didn't help people. It just put people under more pressure. And, you know, I think there's probably people who, who were part of these schemes have actually been pushed to the age and, you know, committed suicide. I think people would have, you know, it's not committing suicide isn't about one thing. I think it's a, a multiple thing. I think... You know, work program will be responsible for that, and certainly government, government policies. So I was interested in, you know, what obligations to uh, society, you know, is, is work really good? I'm, I'm interested in sort of, you know, shaking the idea, notion of work, and I would like to hear what people think about work, and I wanted to find out more about what uh, Aboriginal peoples uh, thought about work as well. And also I was interested in land, uh, and our landscape, because I became sort of quite an environmentalist, sort of, in that ad hoc sort of roundabout way. Um, probably a lot to do with, you know, cycling by slag heaps and the black dust in the eyes or thinking, God, it's got to be better than this, hasn't it? Um, and, and the idea of how, when you look at the landscape, I mean, we sort of noticed, when we were coming across yesterday, we were just talking about, uh, Fiona pointed out, all the stone walls. And there's like, what stone by stone they've been built. And there's like so many miles of them, thousands of miles of them. All that work, the landscape, when you look at it and you actually think about it, it's laboured, it's not natural, it's like totally, you know, the, the British Isles is totally labour. And obviously I, I was brought up in a, a very sort of labour-intensive area. 
the pits, the slag heaps, I mean, didn't matter which way you went, you seemed to find a slag heap somewhere. And even dust on the streets, went black, sorry, black coal dust on the streets from the deliveries and that, which was quite interesting. Um, so I was interested in that, I was interested in sort of labour on the landscape uh, and how we use land and resources. And so I went with these ideas to Australia uh, to see, you know, if the Australian experience is much different or similar. And that there is some similarities, I think, and you know, quite a few differences as well. Um, the first thing that really struck, well, I think probably could speak for everybody here, um, is that the attitude towards land was totally different to ours. It wasn't about uh, resources and exploiting the wealth. We sort of saw land as a job, and I think it's one of the things that pointed out that when we were there that really struck me is that the land's got an intrinsic value, it should be kept for the land's sake, not for what the wealth you can gain from it. Uh, and Aboriginal peoples see themselves as stewards of the land, where we seem to be toiling on the land, it's about working it and taking extracting and exploiting it. And there seems to be a difference in, in that way of thinking. And, and because of that, Aboriginal objections and, and complaints in a political sort of stance seem to be a more about, you know, not just stewardship land, but retain that land and their rights to the land, that there isn't such a thing as who can own the land. Uh, and also, that, uh, you know, this, they had an idea basically that it's a world, the worldview is like they haven't got an authority as well, as well, which is one of the things about the ownership I found strange. We were like looking up to people who were, you know, aristocratic, these people got money, these are better, you know, it's the, the land and gentry or whatever. But because the, the Aboriginal peoples don't have a religion per se, they believe in a worldview, there was no sort of authority figure. And Aboriginals seem to have a, 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 an idea that what you do is it's about consensus, it's about sharing ideas and everybody talking. And I found that actually fascinating compared to what our experience was where we tiled the land. So here was, here was Aboriginals wanting a political uh, input and a very sort of pure, almost purely democratic sort of input about consensus um, and wanting land rights and actually maintaining and protecting the land. Yet here, were, here was my people actually wanting to volunteer to be oppressed. I found the, the idea, uh, the Aboriginal idea, extremely sort of, well, um, awake, as an awakened for us again. It brought us back to my childhood and then questions with my grandfather. Um, also, um, there are, because that, the people, like I said, it's quite a consensus that um, the Aboriginal peoples do have not only a relationship with the land, but with each other. It's a closeness, it's like people first. And so, so the job rule, which I found quite interesting, you know, the idea of being employed, is actually secondary to the human. We seem to have it slightly the other way, well, more than slightly. I mean, I feel like, you know, that I'm seen as some sort of, you know, economic unit. And if I'm not economic, then I'm, I'm not even worthy, <laughs> worthwhile unit at all. I'm disregarded. Uh, and I found, you know, we've got to profit above people, where the Aboriginal people's idea is people above profit, which I found quite nice as well. Quite sort of um, liberating in a way, I think, I suppose. Um, when it comes to, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of chat, chat, I'll talk a little bit about as well the sort of how work, work works or work doesn't work in Australia. And unfortunately, because Bob isn't here, Bob was supposed to be talking about that. So I have got a little bit of info, a little bit of one, two things, but I'm still, I'm sort of, I'm still sort of working on that. What? Five minutes? Yeah. Okay. I'm, some, I'm still sort of working on that um, idea, but a couple of things I did find out is, despite the Aboriginal people's own views and their own, I think they've got the IDD, Mary's IDD? you got the IDD? Oh, yeah, IDD. 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 Yeah, uh, it's an organisation, yeah. yeah that helps um, the Aboriginal peoples get to work mm -hmm. and supports them. But overlaying that, of course, is the whole sort of, you know, Australian government policies, mm -hmm. which unfortunately is very much like uh, the same sort of experience I had with um, the work programme. It's large corporations who are there to basically force people into work mm -hmm. uh, and get a reward for and I think, you know, part of the problem, one of the things I've sort of come across, I've met people who were in the job centre and, you know, they're not the sort of caring sort of people. They're yeah. nice people, but you wouldn't imagine them working in a, in a hospital or whatever. And yet, yet they've been pushed to the jobs and they end up as carers. And you're thinking, 
my goodness, I don't want you know these people <laughs> working with my parents or you know my partner. And so there's, there's sort of a very negative effect I think that goes into work from a very sort of uh, this work ethic that you you should be employed that you, you should be pushed into a job and that's all you are you're an economic unit. Uh, and also found another one little aspect about um, a couple of aspects which I found quite disturbing as well about employment for um, Aboriginal people is that it was mentioned, Charmaine mentioned how people were taking on this training, it was like small courses, you know, we need people. And as long as it was funded, as long as the money was coming through, uh, they were fine. They do train for four, five, six months or whatever. And then once the funding was ending, then people were just dumped back into unemployment. And so it became a cycle of sort of, you know, unemployment for people and struggling uh, and insecurity for people. And also, uh, another horrendous, I've heard it actually mentioned, I'm sure, I may, I may be wrong here, but I think David Cameron mentioned it once, he was probably the type to mention it, but this idea of benefits, of, you know, having vouchers for benefits. And the Aboriginal peoples have suffered for that for years. And I think, are they wanting to actually introduce it though in certain areas as well, Mary? Or? Um, that's the... Um, Was it the Northern Territory? Mainly the Northern Territory, but they're experimenting throughout other states with it too. So mm -hmm. You, um, you, your money is controlled by the government, and you can only spend your money if you vouchers at certain, certain places, yeah. um, supermarkets and things yeah. like that. And the supermarket might be hundreds of miles away, you know, but somehow you've got to get there. Uh, otherwise, you, you will be cut off too. Yeah. You know what I mean? and, so it's like so a limited. It's a really cruel. System. It's a, yeah, it's a cruel system. It's like a limited choice, mm. and I, I think you know, it's one of the things I definitely feel that our system mm. does. The policies, there may, be, there may be some policies that's quite quite well intentioned, but in the end, our policies seem to be punitive, and mm. uh, sanctioning. If you think about sanctioning, going back to sanctioning is the last point. If you think about sanctioning, you've got no money. You're struggling. I was like my example. I was just getting the debt, borrowing off other people, or people were helping me out. But once you get in that situation, if I, if I was in prison, I would have been fed. So I'm, I'm somebody who's a criminal, in a sense, you know, because I haven't got a job. So basically that's, um, cut long story short, some of the things I, just wanted to sort of, I found were different, and to sum up, um, obviously the idea of ownership I found very interesting. Um, the ideas of how we see land as well, and, and through this the whole idea of authority, and how we look at... Um, the world, and I think ownership, because of the authority, seems to lead one a certain path where we think about the world, and I don't think it's necessarily conducive to uh, getting the best out of people or um, making better or good culture. Is Matthew would say? Fantastic. All right, just some quick questions. I, I was brought up in industrial South Wales, so I. I understand the nature of the mining community and so on. And, and here's my question. This conference, this project is about, as Matthew said, about communities in flux. And at one point, Tony, you said, well, I don't really see, I don't get any, don't see the point of work in a way, and there's nothing yeah. sort of in it. But That's my personal uh, experience. Of, yeah, of no, no, sure. Yeah. But I think perhaps in a, a non-romantic way, there was quite a lot in it for people who were in mining communities, namely that they were in communities. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and so there, the, the, the sense of, of being stigmatised if you didn't work, if you, if you didn't put your weight, um, is understandable because it really was true that you know all these people yeah. around, right, they're all doing something. Yeah. Well, what are you doing then? And if the answer is nothing, mm -hmm. well, you're failing... Your, 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 yeah. your fellow, your, your fellow and people. Yeah, exactly. Now, I felt as bad, the yeah. community goes, mm -hmm. all right, the dirty work's gone, the, mm -hmm. even the danger's gone, the emphysema's gone, but the community's gone too, and I, I mm -hmm. think that's a, a serious Definitely, oh, I problem. definitely agree with that. that. I mean, that's what I said about talking about Ashley Main Street, the whole idea that community was a close-knit community. And, you know, it's, it's this weird dichotomy, which we've talked about a few times, how, you know, working in a, a mine, some of these jobs are horrible. I mean, we pound, we, my families didn't want to work on them, but as a, as a sort of as a sort of result of that, there was a very tight knit community, like you say, uh, and which is a positive thing. I don't think it's all black and white. Unfortunately, my experiences of work 
weren't very good. <laughs> and uh, I did feel, I mean, there was a community, certainly when I was younger, I really sort of felt, you know, it was guilt. I felt guilt, I felt I was letting my family down, that I didn't have a job. And, you know, jobs at that time were difficult. And once a minor strike started, of course, <clears throat> what happened is all the miners suddenly were on strike, so they started rushing around doing cash and hand jobs, and, you know, nobody could get it. It was even more competitive, you know, we were all fighting amongst ourselves. So it was a very, very difficult time. But I agree with you. I totally agree. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, yeah. I find it interesting to hear about, and, and obviously learn about the, the British end of industrialisation because Dublin and Ireland never really had an industrial period as such. Um, we had a bit of mining for a while and it, it kind of disappeared. But we did see types of economic practices that were traditional end, certainly, mm -hmm. between the 40s and 80s in Dublin in particular. And what I found, and in essence what comes from what you're talking about, and I think what you mentioned earlier, is that in essence when one ends peasant, working class economic practices, you succeed in destabilising communities um, who have a voice and when you, you know, when you destabilise a community and, and they fracture, it's, it, it's a way of taking away a potential voice which is able to work together to protest. Mm -hmm. you know? And I just think it's, it's, it's one of those things that's very interesting to think about in relation to how economic practices are ended. Uh, and maybe there's this subversive uh, knowledge that what, what they actually do is they disband cohesiveness and voices that would protest. And in Dublin, our biggest way of destabilizing the voice of community was exurbanization. So this is taking the communities that you know, were formed in the city center and essentially sending them out into suburbia in, in great swaths. And so then you take away the community and, and families who actually consider themselves families, connected to families, connected to families, and, and so on and so forth. And, and sort of the contemporary expression of that now in Ireland is that even though there are now suburban housing estates, there isn't communities. Because things that link communities together are some of those commonalities that are connected to employment. Yeah. That shared experience of knowing what, what it means to work in a particular way, to have a rhythm connected to that work, and a, a knowledge of what it means to earn a certain living, and you know, kind of all of these things, mm -hmm. on so many levels. Are, and I just think it's quite interesting to think about the notion of how one ends a practice is actually a much bigger, uh, devious thing of, of getting rid of consolidated voices mm -hmm. that have the potential to disrupt. I certainly, one of the experience of the, the call centre, um, I was in Newcastle, yet the people we were targeting was the southwest. You know, we didn't have any, it was like just the end of a phone. We didn't sort of see them people. It wasn't as if you sat across a desk and saw the state of somebody, it was just, you know, your disembodied voices. And so there's this distance as well, I think. You know, technology gives you that possibility to do that sort of thing. Okay, shall we uh, thank Tony for a brief